My name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Kishwani. <coughs> we are here because we want to prepare for the GRE. We have been solving GRE math problems out of this book here. The official guide to the revised GRE, the second edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. We are, we are finished doing almost all the problems from this book. If there is any problem at all that gives you difficulty and if you wish to watch the solution to it, you will find all the solutions from day number 251 through 400. From 251 through 400. This book happens to contain almost all exactly the same problems and in most cases appearing on exactly the same page numbers as the ones that appeared in the first edition of the revised GRE. We are finished doing all the problems from this book. In the event that you are interested in watching the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Original solutions tend to be a little lengthier, they tend to be a little bit more in depth. Right now, we are in the process of solving quantitative comparison questions. Quantitative comparison questions are still a big chunk of the exam, they have not gone away. Unfortunately, the revised GRE books that I just showed you do not contain enough quantitative comparison questions for us to practice on. To get some extra practice, from day number 401, we begin solving some quantitative comparison question from this book right here. And right now, we are on page number 279. Please turn to it. Page number 279, the very first problem on the, on the page there, problem number 11. Here is what the problem is to say. Problem number 11. Is it, it's page number 280 rather, not 279. On the next page, number 11, when it appeared in the exam, question number 11, 45% of the people who had, had no trouble with this thing, half the people, little over half the people actually did miss it. We are told that area of a circle, area of a circle with radius one four meter is x squared meter. One more time, we are told that we have a circle whose radius happens to be one quarter of a meter and we are told that the area of such a circle, circle with a radius of one quarter meter, we are told is x square meter. And what we are being asked to compare is column A here, which is x versus column B Let's do it here. Column A, X versus column B, one quarter. I keep changing my mind as to where I want to put it. What I want you to do is, if I forget to remind you any time, you should do it on your own instinctively, as I've told you many times in the past. As I said, we, we began this process on 401, day number 401. Every time I remind you that as soon as I finish setting up the problem, you, you must pause the video and do the problem yourself. And once you have done it yourself, then you compare your work against the work that you and I are going to do together in a second. So here we go. I'll give you five seconds to pause and unpause the video. All right, here we go. We are told that we have a circle. We know that area of the circle, we know that area of a circle is simply pi r squared. Pi times r squared, r we know is one quarter of a meter. So it's one quarter squared, which boils down to pi over 16. That's the area of the circle. And we are told that that is x. So that is x. x equals pi over 16. That's what that is. So x equals pi over 16. Let's stick it in here, which is exactly why I didn't want to do it here, because now I have to continue. I'm not going to erase it. Let's continue right here. So here's our column A here. Column A tells us, column A, now we have x, we have pi over 16, and in column B, we have one quarter. What can we do? Well, there are a couple of things we can do. There are a couple of things we can do, but we're going we're gonna to go with the simpler version, the quicker way. The quicker way is to make sure that their denominators are the same. If their denominators are the same, then we can compare the numerators. So let's compare them. Let's multiply this, this fraction by 4 over 4. It's column B. Let's multiply column B by 4 over 4, which is just 1. And what we end up is 4 over 16. And now, so what we're comparing now is pi over 16 versus 4 over 16. Pi over 16 versus 4 over 16. 16 plays no role now because they are the same denominator 
and of course we know pi is less than 4. Pi is less than 4, of course. The answer is B. The answer is B because the value of pi is less than 4. Let's go to the next one, number 12. Number 12. Number 12, when it appeared in the exam, about 37% of the people uh, got it right. The rest of the people had trouble with it. Here, here's what we are told. Column A, we have cost of X pounds, cost of X pounds of meat at Y dollars per pound. Cost of X, X pound of meat, we are told if the cost of the meat is y dollars per pound versus cost of y pound, y yard rather, y yard, they want to be cured, cost of y yard of material at x dollars per yard. Let's erase the previous problem so we can concentrate on this one. Again, one more time, I'm going to read this to you in, in the event that you have trouble with my handwriting and then I'm going to get out of your way, okay? Cost of X pounds of meat at Y dollars per pound versus cost of Y yard of material at X dollars per yard. Pause the video, do it yourself and then we'll do it together in a second. Let's see what we can do. But how do we find the cost of x pounds x pounds of meat if each one costs y dollars per pound. Think of it. How would you figure out the cost of 5 pounds of meat if we are told that the meat costs 3 dollars per pound? If meat costs 3 dollars per pound to, five, to buy 5 pounds, you can multiply it by 3 dollars per pound. You can multiply, in other words, I'm making it far too complicated. If, 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 you, if you're buying 5 pounds and each pound costs 3 dollars per pound, Obviously, it will be 5 times 3. That's what that is. The, the result here is cost of X pounds of meat at y pounds, y pounds per dollar is X times Y. Cost of Y yard at X dollars per yard. X dollars per yard is just Y times X. X times Y, of course, is equal to Y times X. That's all. The answer is C. You're going to end up spending the same amount of money. You're going to end up spending the same amount of money if I buy three pounds of meat at five dollars per pound or if I buy five yards of material at three dollars per yard, of course I'm going to end up spending the same amount of money. In both cases I'm going to have to pay fifteen dollars because I'm buying five yards of material at three dollars per yard and here I'm buying five pounds of meat, uh, three pounds of meat at five dollars per, per pound. You get the idea. You understand? It's, it's the same idea. It's the same, same amount rather. The answer is C. It makes me wonder why people miss, so many people miss it. There is no uncertainty here. There is no such thing as we do not know the value of Y. Let me, let me get, uh, we do not know the value of X and Y. Let me get in a little bit more detail here since, 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 since I brought up the subject here very quickly, okay? In this exam, when you're doing the quantitative comparison question, we always talk about the nice numbers, nice numbers and nasty numbers. Nastiest of all, nastiest of all that causes that causes complication is zero. Obviously, we can't use zero here. Nobody's going to give you anything for free, and nor are you going to go to to the market and buy zero yards of material. It'll be silly. So zero is ruled out. Zero does not apply in this scenario. The next nastiest we have is negative. A negative cannot. You cannot. You cannot buy negative amount of material, or nor can you pay negative amount of price. Do you understand? The shopkeeper is not going to pay you three dollars to buy one one pound or something. They rule out negative, they rule out zero. Only thing that is left is zero, negative, or I should go in sequence. One, negative, and fractions. Even if you pay, I'm making it far too complicated, even if you buy with one, one yard or something, you'll, it'll be this. And if you, if you buy here, one dollar per, per yard, it'll be simply x. They'll always be equal, no matter what happens. And there is no point in putting in fractions here. If you could put, you could plug, put in fractions, but it's not going to serve any purpose. You could say that I'm going to pay $37, 37 cents for a pound of meat, but that will just make life miserable. 
But whatever, whatever amount you use here is the same that you're going to have to use here. Do you understand? The answer is C. Sometimes when something is too simple and you try to explain it too much, it just gets, gets to be a nuisance. It's a very simple, straightforward problem. Number... I thought we just did number 13. Oh, that was number 12. That was question number 12, even though I don't know what I put there, I don't remember it. Let's do 13. Number 13, only a third of the people who took the exam got it right, two thirds of the people who took the exam missed it. It's very important that you pause the video immediately, solve it yourself first, and then look at the solutions that you and I are going to work on together. Don't just sit there and watch the solution, it'll be pointless, it'll be futile, it'll be a sheer waste of time. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to do the work yourself first. That's how we learn. Do you understand? Here's what we're told. We are told that a plus 5 times a minus 5, we are told equals 0. We are also told that b plus 5 versus b minus 5 equals 0. And what we are being asked to compare is column A, we have a plus 5, and column B, we have b plus 5. Again, one more time, one more time, very quickly, we are told that a plus 5 times a minus 5 equals 0. We are also told that b plus 5 times b minus 5 equals 0. And what we are being asked to compare are these two quantities, a plus 5 versus b plus 5. I'll let you uh, pause and unpause the video for 5 seconds and do the problem yourself. Alright, let's see what we can do here. If you look at the first equation here, we are told that a plus 5 times a minus 5 equals 0. That implies, you see, if we have two quantities, if we have two quantities a times b, if we are told that a times b equals 0, it only means one or two, one or the other things. Either a is equal to 0, in which case it doesn't matter what b is, either a is equal to 0, in which case 0 times b would be 0, or maybe b is equal to 0. That's the only way the product is going to be 0. When the product of two quantities is equal to 0, for that matter, product of any number of, quant of quantities is equal to 0, at least one of those quantities has to be 0. That's the only way you're going to get product to be 0. If, if, if somebody comes up to you and tells you that a times b times c times d times e times f times g is equal to 0, then one of those quantities has to be 0 at least. Or maybe more than one is equal to 0, or maybe they are all equal to 0. But at least one of them has to be 0. So, if a times b is equal to 0, this implies that this implies that either, either a plus b is equal to a plus 5 is equal to 0, or a minus 5 is equal to 0. We're making too much fuss about nothing. I know that you already know that. So this implies that a is equal to negative 5, and this would imply that a is equal to positive 5. In other words, what this tells us, what this tells us is that a is equal to positive or negative 5. And the exact same thing will appear here. When we look at the b, when we, when we put down here b plus 5 times b minus 5, b plus 5 times b minus 5 equals 0, this implies that b is equal to either positive or negative 5. Are you with me so far? Now we look at the two quantities. When we get to the comparing the two quantities here, the very first thing you want to do is make your life as simple as possible. Take out all the unnecessary things, things that, is, that, that are put in there just to, just to make, make it look complicated, just to, just to annoy you. That part will be the 5 part. 5 appears in both columns. That 5 serves no purpose. We are just comparing A and B. So what do we do next then? Well, if A happens to be 5 and B happens to be 5, then the answer is C. If A happens to be negative 5 and B happens to be negative 5, the answer is still C. But if A happens to be 5 and B happens to be negative 5, the answer would be A. If A happens to be negative 5 and B happens to be positive 5, the answer would be B. All we know is that A is either positive 5 or negative 5. All we know is that B is either positive 5 or negative 5. But we don't know which one. Since we do not know which one, as long as they have the same signs, they're going to be both equal to each other. But if they have opposite signs, they're not going to be equal. That's the summary of it. The bottom line here is this. The bottom line is that, if the, as long as they have the same sign, if, if they are of the same sign, if they are both positive, if they are both positive or negative, if they are both positive or negative, the answer is C. Answer is C. This is the bottom line. This is this, this is a summary. This is a summary of the whole process that we did here. 
if if they are if they are if they are not if they are not of the same sign if they are not of the same sign it doesn't it really, it really doesn't matter whether it's a or b it really doesn't matter that part that we did there was actually a waste of time all we have to realize is that if they are of the same sign the answer will be c if they are not of the same sign the answer is not going to be c voila in one case answer is C, in other case it is not, it really doesn't matter whether it's A or B, it's still of no interest to us. In one case it is C, in the other case it is not, and therefore the answer is D. That's all. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.